<clears throat> zebra mussels. <laughs> Interesting story. Uh, these came over from China, a, a, a container ship, a freighter, took on ballast water in Shanghai Harbor. This was the early 70s, 74, I believe. And they know the name of the ship. They know when this, the, exactly when this happened. Uh, ballast water is water that a, a ship can take on in holding tanks. And it's, it's aptly named. It's used to help ballast and stabilize the ship. And depending on the weight of your cargo, you balance that with the weight of the water to, to, to maintain an equilibrium, shall we say, uh, of, of a ship. So she took on this ballast water in Shanghai, and in the, the water were larvae of the zebra mussel, which is throughout Asia. Not a big problem in Asia. There's other species that that uh, kind of keep these these guys in in check. Whoops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so she comes over, goes through the Panama Canal, comes uh, in through the St. Lawrence River, uh, goes through the uh, the locks around uh, Niagara Falls into Ontario, Erie, uh, Huron. Uh, into Superior. You don't actually have to go into Michigan, Lake Michigan, to get to Superior. She goes into Lake Superior and goes all the way to Duluth, Minnesota, which is on the far western end of Lake Superior. There she discharged her ballast water when she dis discharged her cargo. And released all of these now much larger zebra mussel larvae uh, in, into the water, and the zebra mussel didn't care if it was fresh water or salt water. They flourished. And you can see by the, 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 the coloration of these why they're called zebra mussels, uh, much different than our, our native mussels. And these guys very quickly pushed out the native species of mussels and and took over. <clears throat> they spread from uh, Superior into all of the other Great Lakes and started to wreak havoc. These things grow incredibly fast, much faster and more broadly than the, the native species. They Where you never had mussels before, you suddenly had zebra mussels. Pilings, uh, wharfs, uh, anything in the water would attract these these guys, and, and a colony would be established, and they would just kind of take off. Uh, municipalities had problems with f uh, freshwater intakes. A, a lot of cities drew their, their fresh water from the Great Lakes, and these would get into the intake pipes and grow and literally cut off the, um, the flow. So the cities would have to hire uh, commercial divers to go down and, and <laughs> literally chip these things off and, and um, open up the, the intakes. Um, nuclear power plants in and around uh, Michigan had problems that their cooling water intakes uh, were getting clogged with zebra mussels. Not a good thing with nuclear power plants. And so it's been an ongoing, you know, probably 30, 40, oh geez, almost 50 years um, battle against these zebra mussels. Uh, boat owners, if they left their boats in water, you know, for extended periods of time without a good bottom uh, paint would get covered in zebra mussels. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, just everywhere. And, of course, they start to migrate inland. And we do not have zebra mussels in Lake Monroe, technically, but some people feel that it's just a, a matter of time uh, be, be, before we see them show, uh, show up. And it, particularly marinas, you know, it, it could just be extremely costly um, and, and damaging if, if we get these things. <clears throat> Absolutely, totally freaky gross. Oh my gosh, sea lampreys. I mean, think of a snake that never lets go. 
I mean, just, ugh. They've got these great big mouths that have like thousands of teeth on them, and they, they latch onto a fish like this very nice lake trout, and, and they, they literally suck the life juices out of the fish. And these became a problem, I believe, in the 70s. God, everything happened in the 70s. Um, they came in through the St. Lawrence sea Seaway. Um, they, they spread. It was a, a horrible problem. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know a whole bunch about um, the, the lamprey invasion um, or mitigation. I know that commercial uh, uh, sport fishing uh, operators <clears throat> they will take clients out on the lakes uh, to fish for for salmon or trout, and they'll catch fish that have sea lampreys uh, stuck on them. Um, yeah, that would probably end my fishing uh, fishing for that day. Absolutely, totally gross. I don't even know if you can eat these. Oh God, I wouldn't eat one of these things. Not to be outdone, we have snakeheads <laughs> in the U.S., not in Indiana yet. Really interesting story on <clears throat> how we imported these guys. Um, these are native of, of Asia, and we have very large uh, Asian populations in the U.S., particularly on the East Coast, New York City, and in Florida. So what happened was that a, a business in New York City was importing snakeheads directly from China. They're a delicacy. I mean, really, really good eating, supposedly. And so this, um, this importer in New York City was um, getting uh, uh, snakeheads and selling them around the country, particularly into Florida. There was a grocer in Florida that was buying snakeheads from New York City. And after a while, he started to kind of reason that, why am I buying these from New York City when we have these retention ponds out behind our strip mall? It's Florida. And so he started dumping a couple of these into those retention ponds. And, of course, they grew. And so he could go out and he had his own private little, you know, aquaculture business going here. Except, like everything else, these guys have a tendency of migrating. And it wasn't very long until they escaped the retention pond, got into drainage ditches, and traveled and traveled and traveled. Snakeheads have this um, rather freaky characteristic of being able to travel overland. They can use their, their pectoral fins as, eh, not really legs, but they can anchor themselves long enough to twist their body, and they can gain forward locomotion on dry land, which is not something that we expect from a fish. So in periods of drought, and th this is a this is a natural characteristic of these fish. Uh, during periods of drought in in Asia, these guys are able to move from one body of water that's drying up into hopefully another body of water that's more sustainable. Uh, and so they take full advantage of this in the uh, in the, the the south, moving from one body of water to the other. They traveled from Florida into Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, into Virginia, and up into Maryland. Uh, the alarm was sounded. Um, there's there are several videos. In fact, I think I've got a list of a couple of videos for you to watch on the snakeheads. Um, anytime you put the word snake in something, of course, that's going to draw attention and mm, terror in people. And these are kind of a freaky looking fish. They don't have um, the normal uh, fins that we associate with North American fish. They have a continuous um, dorsal fin and a continuous anal fin. So uh, they actually look very similar to our bow fin uh, f uh, fish, which we didn't cover in class. And they have teeth very similar to like a, a walleye. Uh, not necessarily rip your hand off, but yeah, they could remove a finger or two. Um, this was the, the freak out species of, I don't know, 
the early 2000s, and there were newspaper reports that, you know, these things are going to crow out of the water and across your lawn and, 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 and grab your toddler and take them back into the water and drown them and eat them. And it was all kinds of just absolutely crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, National Geographic did a just a horrible hit piece on these things that, that just hysteria, just total hysteria. Um, DNR actually addressed snakeheads in Indiana, and no, we do not have snakeheads in Indiana. And but people were, were were totally freaked out by these things until fishermen figured out that these are actually a game fish. They are very much a predator. Anything that's named snakehead, you know, has got to be a predator. And um, very much like largemouth bass. I mean, these things will will, will, will track down a, a rapala minnow, you know, uh, dragged across the surface and, and just absolutely nail it. And uh, so sport fishermen kind of tuned in on these things and started to catch them. Um, you can see down in Florida, they've kind of created a almost an industry out of, of fishing for, for snakeheads, um, which is good because this is one way that we can control the the species. The, the fear of the, the snakeheads um, taking over North America, taking over the world, who was much exaggerated, very much like the killer bees uh, hysteria of the 1970s. Yeah, look that up. Very interesting. Um, I lived through that. The stopping point seems to be cold weather. The These guys do not do good in, in cold weather. Uh, Maryland, the, the tidal basin of the... Chesapeake Bay seems to be kind of the their northern boundary, and they really haven't been expanding in in a number of years. They've they've kind of reached their their maximum domain, and for the most part, have kind of settled into the the natural environment. Um, they they haven't been a big deal for for quite a while. So here's a here's a, a, a list of of how you can combat aquatic invasive species. Uh, we talked uh, earlier about do not dump your minnow bucket into the lake. Um, live wells on fishing boats. This is really important. If you're keeping either bait in live wells or keeping uh, your 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 fish in uh, live wells, you've probably taken the water on at that particular lake that you're fishing. So when you pull your boat to go home, you may not dump the water out of the live well. And you go to another lake next weekend, and you do dump the water out at that lake. And so anything from one lake, you have now transported into another lake, just like the zebra mussels from Shanghai to Duluth Harbor in Lake, lake Superior. Don't do this. Empty your live well at the lake that you are fishing each and every time. The other problem that we discovered was that on a lot of boats and, and uh, particularly boat trailers, there were areas that you would trap water. You would back your boat trailer down into the um, into the water at the boat ramp you would bring your your boat uh, on board the trailer and then pull out and go home or maybe go to another lake and as you reverse the process back the boat trailer into the the water any thing that was in that trapped water of the boat trailer would now get transferred into that new lake the industry has responded very well to this, and they've they've there's they've built they now build boat trailers that do not capture water. There's no place for the water to to get held, which is really good from a longevity standpoint of trailers because anytime <clears throat> you trap water um, in wood or, or or metal, you introduce an area of, of rot. Uh, or, or corrosion. So this was actually a, a very good design change. Do not release aquatic invasive species. If you catch a snakehead, if you catch a Asian carp, uh, more specifically <clears throat> if one comes flying into your boat and smacks you in the face, 
you can't throw it back in the water. You have to kill it. This is one place where the regulations say that catch and release is not good. You are by regulation required to kill this this species. Um, <coughs> the other thing you can do is eat more aquatic invasive species. The I have a video on the uh, the unit three about a chef in Chicago who is trying to do exactly that. There are commercial fishermen fishing for Asian carp, and in this this Chicago five star hotel, this uh, this chef is is buying silver carp, I think also big head carp, and turning it into you know gourmet fish cakes and selling it for probably ungodly sums of money. Um, the other interesting thing that is happening is that uh, there's a company in, in Kentucky that has started up that buys commercially caught Asian carp. I mean, these are, are commercial fishermen, boats, nets. They go out, they, they capture a whole bunch of these, these fish take it to the uh, processor and <clears throat> and the processor you know cleans processes the, the fish and I believe they yeah they freeze the fish and export it. We in the U.S. don't really have a taste yet for Asian carp, but guess who does? Yes, China. And so we're catching Asian carp in the U.S. and exporting Asian carp to Asia. They absolutely love it. They don't have the water quality the clean water quality that we have. And so they say that the fish tastes so much better coming from America than it does coming from China. And so there's a, a, a strong market for this. list of some interesting videos you might want to... Um, uh, to partake of. Uh, the first one is the the Polish Christmas carp. Remember how we talked about how the uh, the common carp was very uh, very popular in Eastern Europe and uh, you know Poland and immigrants Polish immigrants into the U.S. have kind of kept the tradition of eating the Christmas carp. Um, if you're of uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, descent uh, or you know Western European, you may enjoy uh, beef for, for Christmas, uh, perhaps uh, goose uh, for, for Christmas. Um, but in, in Eastern Europe, um, a carp was the, the, the popular Christmas dish. And this video talks about uh, uh, in New York City how they will, will buy the carp and take it home, throw it in the bathtub uh, for two or three days. Um, and then harvest the fish and, and prepare it for the, the Christmas dinner. Uh, Maryland did a really good job on the uh, snakehead um, fish. Very scientifically done, um, very factual, very, very well done. The National Geographic uh, snakehead episode is um, very sensationalized, um, kind of over the top. And I'd say generally disappointing. So that pretty much wraps up our aquatic invasive species. And they're here. Um, what other invasive species can you think of into the U.S.? Well, besides us. Um, there is one particular species. It's not a fish. Um, in fact, I'll give you a hint. It's a bird that was imported into 
the U.S. Uh, by hunters in, I believe, 1910 from China that has basically been a roaring success. Not a lot of people know about this, but see if you can figure it out. Uh, leave your, your answer in the, uh, the, the comment. Um, every country has problems with an invasive species. Uh, rabbits in Australia, um, huge problem. Uh, mongoose in the Hawaiian Islands. It's just about every place you go, you, you can figure out that something that's not supposed to naturally be there has gotten there. Um, all due to us, basically. Um, so anyway, um, thank you for your attention, and, we, and we'll talk about some fly fishing uh, gear and tackle and, and flies and techniques and all kinds of good stuff in the next lecture. Stay tuned. <music>